Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn around and someone tell them Jesus has set you free. Jesus has, has set you free. I love the past tense of that. It's so good that we're not trying to get people free, but that freedom has already been given to us. It's already been provided for us in our, in our lives. And so he has set us free. You know, sometimes in life we go along and, and if we don't know the enemy is the source, if we don't know the source behind situations, sometimes we will, we will tolerate them and sometimes we will even make room for them in our life. And uh, Jesus was very keen as he walked through his, his ministry, that the people or the situations where he would know the difference between um, the cause of a sickness. And sometimes he would say that he would rebuke the spirit that was behind that situation. And, and, and so knowing the, the, the source behind it oftentimes is something that we need to be aware of in dealing with, with issues. We know it's always God's will to deliver and set people free, but sometimes we need to listen to how he wants to do it. And then that activates our faith. Otherwise, it just becomes a formula. Otherwise, you just do this, do this, do this. Quote three verses, slap some oil on them and hit them upside the head and God will heal them. Well, I mean, there's verses for all of those things. But it's interesting that Jesus, um, he healed more blind people than any other, minute, in any other situation of illness. And yet every one of them he did differently. Why did he do that? Partly because he wants us to be, make sure that we're led by the Spirit. So we're always exercising faith. The prayer of faith saves the sick and the Lord raised them up. It's not the slapping of the oil or even the laying on of the hands or, or getting enough righteous and holy people or whatever. It's making sure that whatever we do, we do in faith. Why? Because faith is pleasing to the Lord. Amen. Right side's good. Left side's now blurry. <laughs> That's all right. We'll work it. We can work it. Um, the Lord's good. Thank God for, for 2020 vision. Amen. And praise God. He's a good God. Tonight, a, a message. I want us to take a, a, a breather. Everybody take a deep breath. And that feel good. Last four weeks, we've been talking about going through the storms of life. And oh, praise God, hallelujah, and we made it through them storms and bellies of the whale and all kinds of shipwrecks and snakes bites and all kinds of jigger bites and all kinds of stuff along the way here. Tonight, I just feel like the Lord just says, just take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. We made it through the storm. Just say, I made it. Doesn't that feel good? Sometimes we've got to say that in faith, but, but we need to say it. I made it. I want, to, I want to talk about, you know, what shall we say? What shall we say? What shall we say? And, and, and especially when we, we talked about we've gone through the storm and so our purpose is not survival but is to give a testimony for God in our life. And so uh, we go through, through situations in life but it's so that we can have something to say for, about God, for God, to God on the other side as we get going. And we can talk about some of the storms we've gone through in life but I want you to know if you're saved, you made it. Kind of get a better amen. I mean, maybe we need to bring, maybe we need an evangelistic message tonight instead of, if, 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 we've, we, if, we've, if, we're, if we're born again in the family of God, we made it. We're, we're in the family now, the family that's in, that's in heaven and on earth, that there's one father of her. If, we have, if we've accepted Jesus of our, as our Savior and we have, have, have welcomed his lordship, we are in the kingdom of God right now. Not when we, when we die and get in the by and by, but we're in the kingdom. We, we've made it in a sense. And we need to make sure that we have a, a, a reminder and a heart that is full of a revelation of what the Lord has done to us, for us, and wants to do through us, so that we constantly have, have a, a words coming out of our mouth that have power that are in them, power to encourage others, power to release the will of God here on this earth, and power to subdue and suppress the kingdom of darkness. What shall we say at a time such as this in our life? What do we say? Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. So we've got, we've got joy that can come through us because of what the Lord has done for us in our lives. Paul, over and over in Scripture, he would talk about this and, and would encourage us. And I know some people get nervous when you talk about, you know, are you going to talk about confession? Yes, 
How many in this room talk? Well, then we all have a subject here we all need to talk about, don't we? Jesus talked about what we talk about. Jesus actually said, you will be judged over every word you say. Yeah, everybody shut up on that one real quick, didn't we? We, were, we you know, we ain't dumb. We, yeah. So what are we saying? We need to make sure that we are on purpose sharing the truth about Jesus in our life and what he wants to do now that we have made it to the other side, that we are releasing out of our mouth, we are proclaiming the gospel, and we are expecting that God watches over his word that comes out of our mouth that he's going to perform it. See, we don't believe that, do we? Yes, we do. Talk me down. Go ahead. Tell me what it needs to be. You see, the problem is it seems like the further we get away from the resurrection, the more we talk about the proclamation of the gospel, but the less we talk about the demonstration of the gospel. We, we, talk, about, we talk about Jesus historically. We, we talk about the, the doctrines of the Bible. We talk about maybe even good behavior, but we need to also have the declaration that Jesus told his disciples that when you go out after I do, you shall do the works that I do and greater works than these. At Mark 16 is in my Bible. You might have taken it out of yours, but I still believe that the believing ones should speak with other tongues, should cast out devils, should lay hands on the stick, and when the enemy comes to destruct with destruction, they should trample on scorpions and on the heads of serpents in Jesus' name. I still believe that if I'm going out and preaching the gospel, that Jesus still goes with me and confirms the gospel with signs following. And they ain't supposed, shouldn't follow 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They ought to be right behind me. Amen. Confirming the word that is spoken. What are we saying? Making sure that we are proclaiming the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8. You know this portion of scripture. Romans chapter 8, verse 30 and 32. I'm not going to read the whole thing. And it would be great for us to, to kind of go and look at this if we have the time. But Wednesday night, we're a little condensed on time. You can go and, and pull it apart, think about it, meditate up. But let's just look at just a couple of words here. And then um, uh, I'm going to use the, the mic here in a minute. Dorinda is going to come and is going to share a testimony tonight. How many of you like to hear what God's doing? That's right. I'm tired of hearing what the devil's doing, what the politicians are doing. All I want to hear about what God's doing. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 30 and 32, the Amplified says, And those whom he, did, did he predestinated... He also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, listen to this, declared free of the guilt of sin. Isn't that wonderful? That the Lord has declared you free from the guilt of sin. Why is that so powerful? Because I've seen people that will mentally agree that God has forgiven them, but the guilt the guilt that's there. The guilt that seems to, 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 to control their decisions. The guilt that controls their relationship with God. I think God's forgiven me, but I still feel guilty. So I'm not for sure he loves me. I'm not for sure God would want to use someone like me because I still feel guilty. And that's why we've got to confess what God's word says about us more than what we feel about us. Amen? The word says I'm free. The word says I'm free from sin. I'm free from its authority. I'm free from its effect. That doesn't mean that I can go around and do everything I want. It just means it no longer has authority over me because I'm under the authority of Jesus. And I believe his blood has more redemptive power than sin has guilt power in my life. He says here that he has already, already done this amazing thing, declared us free of the guilt of sin, and those whom he justified, he also glorified, raising them into the heavenly di dignity. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can successfully stand against us? 
The understanding here is the same as what we've seen in the Old Testament. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. We love to preach that. But understanding, that means that there are weapons that are formed against us, you understand. There are attacks that will come against us. There are enemies that will come against us. But no weapon formed will come, that comes against us will prosper or be successful. We can stand against every one of them. We can't. And here he's saying that, what shall we say to these things? If God before us, no one can successfully stand against us, especially in this realm of blaming and guilt passing. If God has forgiven you, you can receive it, and it doesn't matter what others say about it because they haven't had the revelation of what Jesus has done for you. And even though you may still call me guilty, I call me redeemed. Now, please understand, I don't have to get you to change your mind about me. I just now need to start to live differently in front of you. You can call me guilty. I need to call me redeemed because of what Jesus, and I can successfully say, if the Lord, is, if the Lord has declared me free, then it doesn't matter what others say about me. There's a whole level there of freedom, folks, that we can start to live in. He goes on in verse 32 and he says, He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him generously give us all things? The focus is a relationship with the Lord. The focus is what he has done in us, through us, for us. But then if you receive that, that incredible relationship that we now have, it should affect every other area of our life. How will he not, if he did that, how will he not generously do anything for us that we need? It changes the way we talk about our God and the way we talk about things that come against us in our lives. What shall we say? What is your present testimony about God in your life? What is your present testimony about what Jesus has done for you and doing through you? What is your present testimony about what the Lord is, is doing in your life because he's done so much? Well, pastor, he saved me 55 years ago. Well, praise God. But if he did that 55 years ago, and if he wants to do all of this amazing stuff, surely there's some more things in that 55 years he wants to do in your life that you want to talk about. Surely there's some incredible things that God wants to do. He is still an amazing God. He still is a God that wants to do incredible things in our life. He still is a God who wants us to say, when enemy comes against us, problems come against us, obstacles, sickness, disease, tragedies in our life, he still wants us to boldly say, yes, but the Lord is still on my side. He is still with me, and he's still on the inside of me. And if God be for me, then what can stand against me in life? And we live in that regardless of what it looks like and the circumstances that are around us. That we're boldly declaring what God and his amazing thing is doing in us and through us to accomplish his will. As I was preparing for the message tonight where since the Lord wanted to go and then I didn't actually, Dorinda sent me the, a card with that, that testimony in it and I got it just in the mail today and actually didn't get it till this afternoon. I thought, wow, well, how well that goes along with with the message tonight. You know, sometimes we hear these incredible stories on TV about at another church about somebody who we don't know, and, and, and let's just be honest, we say, well, you know, I ain't got no proof about that. This is a lady that was sitting right over there about where Jackie was. That service, and we prayed that simple prayer that night, just in Jesus' name, be healed. And she testified that night that there was a notable difference. And, and, and Dorinda noticed that night there's a notable, those that were there could sense the trimming was started, started to subside. Some of you were there and felt that. This is not a, a, a something that was just, just on TV and we, we've, we've, we've come up with. This has happened. But I'll, this is where your pastor needs to, re, I had to repent when I read that card. Because I, I remember that happening and then hearing about a, a couple of days later that the symptoms all came back. And I, I oh. That's not supposed to be. 
I was more moved by the symptoms than I was my faith in the Lord. And I was like, man, I hated that that happened, but I almost just, well, it's almost just, well, instead of having a strong belief in if God, God surely wouldn't heal her and then just let her go back. We need to contend for these things. Huh? We need, we need to, 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 well, maybe it didn't, maybe it did come back. Well, let's, if God heal her, then let's believe in healing. If, if Jesus is the healer, let's believe in healing. Let's contend for these. Let's have a confession of faith. What shall we say to these things? And, and encourage one another along the way. Fight for this. And sometimes we need to speak to the elephant in the room. Sometimes we need to talk about the elephant in the room. Otherwise, uh, uh, folks, if elephants hang around long, things don't get better. Things, things get worse really quick if we don't deal with it. So, so I, I read that. Part of me repented. God, forgive me for giving up. Forgive me for not keeping my faith strong in that area. Forgive me for not just believing in the miraculous. Do we believe in the miraculous? Or do we believe in the miraculous only when we see it? And I believe that, that God's stirring us up as a church and, and, and these incredible stories that have been sharing you know, with different people, people that have been uh, prayed over, that come out of comas, and people that have, uh, have problems like that that are so obvious that, that God's healing them. You know, it, sometimes it's more, let's say it this way, goodness, sometimes it's easier to say things in a crowd of a thousand or five thousand. If I stand up and say, I believe somebody here has a headache, migraine headaches, and you have a crowd of 5,000. How many of you know there's probably somebody there who's got a migraine? You get a group of 50, and you've got to be led by the Lord because we all know everybody in the room pretty much. But I think God is, is revealing himself to us as a small group. We know that person. I was the one touching them. I felt that change. It's stirring on the inside of us so that we're going to be able to see the works of God in a greater dimension, and we're going to believe that, that God's working. And, then, and, it, and I think that testimony is just a good encouragement. If you pray for someone, don't give up. If you're going to give up, don't pray for them in the first place. Huh? Just keep your hands in your pockets. But if we're going to get him out and if we're going to put God out there and say in Jesus' name, then let's stick with it along the way. Let's not give up. Let's believe. What shall we say if God's before us? Who can be against us? If we're praying for someone and if God's for us, what sickness can be against us? What problem can be against us? What situation can be, be, be against us? What demon dare be against us? Does it really matter who's against us when God is for us along the way? So having that bold confession, keep stirring it up on the inside of us. Keep coming out of, uh, in our lives. Remember in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. You can just write this down, Ephesians 1, 3. But just remember what the Lord has done for us. Blessed and worthy of praise. The reason I, I want to read this out of the Amplified Translation, we run over it real quick in the King James from memory sometimes, but it says, Blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why am I saying worthy of praise? Because then that talks about what I'm saying out of my mouth. If I'm praising the Lord, it's an understanding that I've got some, some words that are coming out of my mouth. I know I can lift my hands and praise the Lord. I know I can bow and praise the Lord. I know there's different uh, positions, you know, naturally speaking. But most times when it talks about praising the Lord, there is some, some verbal action that's involved here. Folks, we need to start praising the Lord. About what? Well, praise the Lord, the, be the God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has already done, did it. He has blessed us. He has blessed us. He has blessed us. You are a blessed people. We are blessed of the Lord. We are blessed of the Lord. We're not just blessed by someone in this natural world. Someone just didn't bless me with a $20 bill or a $30 bill or a 40, 45, 50, 50, 50. We didn't just bless us in some natural way. We've been blessed by the Almighty God. Just think about it for a minute. Even in God's perspective, if it was a small blessing from Him, 
what, what's a small blessing from a God his size? It's incredible. It's huge. But he has blessed us. He, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Folks, we ought to get a little Pentecostal here once in a while. Every spiritual blessing, there ought to be some... We, we, just go home and think about that for a while and try sitting down and going to sleep. Every spiritual blessing. He didn't leave anyone out of any one of the blessings. Incredible, isn't it? He didn't leave one blessing out of any of our lives. He says, I've already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. The concept, the idea is not that I'm holding them out here and you can't get them till you get to heaven. He's simply saying, I've got them in a safe place so no one else can get to them. Moth and, and thieves can't steal them. Nobody can break in and get your blessing from you. No one can steal one of his blessings. No one can say, oh, you, you know, Chris, I want my blessing. Well, it timed out. You lost on that one. No. All spiritual blessings are held in heaven, a place of resource, so that we can draw on them while we are here on this earth. And there's the God of this world system cannot stop what heaven has blessed us with. Now, if you're trying to get something from this world, the God of this world system can cause some roadblocks along the way. That's oftentimes why finances are oftentimes difficult to get into the kingdom of God because money's in this world. God's not up in heaven printing $100 bills. We don't ever see Jesus tell someone to put out their hand and, and, a, and a gold Roman coin just miraculously appears in their hand. Now, I did tell him, go catch a fish and you'll be surprised what's on the inside of it. But he didn't make money appear to them. But he did say... That my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. He has ways to meet all of our needs. But we need to stop and think for just these spiritual blessings that he has in, in store for us. They are there for us. Not waiting for us when we get to heaven. But waiting for us to tap into them while we're here on this earth. Jesus said I'm not of this world. Therefore this world has no authority or power over my life. Therefore, he went around not waiting, not looking at this world in any way that it's going to limit me, but he was, going to, he was going to transform this world. He wasn't challenged by this world. We need to get a, a Jesus concept in the way that we live life slash do ministry. Isn't it interesting even in, and in, in we're about out of time here tonight, but isn't it interesting even in Jesus' ministry where there was a gentleman that comes up to him and, and, and he says, you know, we ask your disciples to do something and they couldn't help my son and he seems to be demon possessed or something crazy is going on here. And all, of, and all of a sudden his son starts throwing himself on the ground and rolling around and, and, and Jesus didn't get nervous. He didn't start screaming at the demon or anything. He just turned to the dad and said, so how long has he been doing this? His ministry was not controlled by the circumstances. If we're not careful when we go to minister to people, we react about what's going on instead of just be still and say, Lord, what do you want to happen here? What do you want to happen here? How do you want to minister? I'm more in tuned with my heavenly resources than this natural situation. This is where we start to step up, folks, and say this isn't just about me. It's about how to minister supernaturally to the world around me. And if I pray for someone and they start to change and then they go back, do I just say, must not have been the Lord's will? Or would you be saying, no. Heaven's resource is going to have an influence in this life, and I don't care how long it's going to take. I don't care. Because if God is for me, who can be against me along the way? Lazarus, he's over here, he's sick. We better hurry and get over there before he dies and pray for him. Jesus, ah, just because of that, we're going to wait another day. Knowing that he'll be dead by the time he gets there. Why? Because this present world did not control his resources. And he drew from those heavenly resources. Does miracles, or they come from this earth, or do they come from 
the world to come. They come from heaven. And so as we tap into heaven, we can start to believe miracles and the supernatural start to happen here on this earth more and more in our lives. If, we, if we're more consumed with the circumstances, then we start coming up with religious testimonies. Religious testimonies are about just, well, must not have been the Lord's will. Religious testimonies are where well, God must have wanted them in heaven, and so he took them home early. Religious testimonies give excuses instead of confident faith. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care. It's an incredible story. Smith Wigglesworth would go and take dead bodies and would throw them up against the wall and say, you're going to live. You're going to live. And you know what happened? No, they fell. Yeah. So you know what he did? Picked them up and threw them back up against that wall and said, no, you're going to live until they lived. Now, I don't know that I'm quite right there, but I think we ought to start working with some colds and some sniffles and some sneezes if we're going to start raising the dead. Huh? Because natural circumstances, if we're not careful, will control our feelings, which will limit our faith. But we're going to understand what God's grace has done for us. And we're going to start to speak what God wants to do in us and through us. Find some area in your life. You know, Dorinda said it, so we'll just go with it. What's the elephant in your room? What's the elephant in your life? What's the elephant in your home? Why won't you talk about it? Ignoring it, if you haven't noticed, doesn't make it go away. Declaring God's word starts to then let God's will have its way. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the presence of the Almighty in our life. Thank you for the supernatural presence of God. Lord, we thank you for this, this, this group. And we refuse to allow ourselves to just go through religious moments. We want to have God Almighty ministering life through us. Teach us, prepare us. Lord, first of all, we ask, Holy Spirit, put a watch over our mouth. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. May they be words of faith, not evil reports of doubt and unbelief. May they be words that glorify God, not words that confirm the present situation. May they be words that declare the will of God prophetically over situations so that you can watch over your word to perform it. Father, we thank you that the name of Jesus is above every name. And whatever situation, problem, circumstance that has been tolerated in our life, tonight we start to talk about God's grace to move that thing out of our life so that we'll have a testimony of the greatness of God. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' holy name, amen.